Okay, great. So as I mentioned, um, we're going to talk about BRC1 and 2, but we're going to start out by just talking about genetics more generally. I do know that Dr. Orr was on earlier today and talked a little bit more about genetics. Um, I did miss his talk, unfortunately, uh, so hopefully there won't be too much overlap. Um, so as Sherry mentioned, I'm at the University of Pennsylvania and at the Philadelphia VA, uh, where I do cancer genetics, and I take care of a lot of both men and women with a variety of cancer uh, predisposition syndromes. So recently, uh, we have established a men and BRCA program within the Basser Center for BRCA at Penn Medicine. Um, and so it is my pleasure to be more involved in the care of men with cancer, particularly from a genetic uh, perspective. So we're first just going to talk a little bit about genetics. So just to get everybody on the same page, and I do uh, apologize if this has uh, been repeated from earlier, um, but just want to make sure everyone, especially anyone who's newly listening, is on the same page about genetics. So as you all may uh, be well aware, we are made up of millions and millions of cells, and those cells contain the instructions or blueprints for creating us as humans. Those blueprints or instructions are stored in what's known as chromosomes, which are made up of a molecule called DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. This in uh, schematic form looks like these little X's here are our chromosomes. We inherit 23 chromosomes from each of our parents, 23 from mom, 23 from dad. And those are made up of these DNA strands, which then in and of themselves are made up of four different uh, nucleotide bases. They are listed here, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. And those can be abbreviated as ACTG. So if anyone has had genetic testing and has looked at their reports, they may have seen this ACTG nomenclature listed um, after some of the gene that, that, uh, that, that were tested. Uh, genes can be thought of as books uh, within the entire instruction manual or uh, and those books within the larger instruction manual. There are about 30,000 books in the human genome. Um, those, each one of those 30,000 books are made up of these letters, and these letters can be uh, deleted, things can be inserted, you can think of chapters coming out, you can think of just individual letters being changed, and that's what we refer to when we talk about changes or mutations in our genes that may lead to some sort of disease. So a mutation, as I mentioned, is a variant or any change in the DNA. So that could be just one single G is changed, for example, to an A, that's a substitution, that G could be deleted, that another nucleotide could be inserted, and then you can have larger parts of our chromosomes. These are schemas of say chromosome four here, where a large part of the chromosome has been deleted here. Oops. Um, you can also get duplications of parts of our chromosomes. Parts of our chromosomes can invert. Um, you can also get insertion of new pieces of material. And then you can get what's called translocations, where one chromosome gives parts of the, part of itself to a different chromosome and back and vice versa. So there are just a lot of different changes that can occur in our DNA. This is how we evolve. But unfortunately, this can also lead to increased risk of a variety of diseases, including cancer. So after that background, let's talk about germline genetic testing and which male breast cancer patients should be tested. So I just want to start out by saying that in this talk, I'm referring to males as men who are individuals who are assigned male sex at birth, also referred to nowadays as AMAB individuals. I am not talking about trans men or trans women who were born uh, male at birth, but identify as females. I'm happy to talk about management and genetic testing in either of those categories of individuals at the end of the talk. Right now, though, we're talking about uh, AMAB individuals. And so who, which uh, individuals who are males should undergo genetic testing if they've had a diagnosis of breast cancer? Well, the answer is pretty easy because that's all of them. So both ASCO, which is our American Society of Clinical Oncology, and NCCN, the National Cancer Comprehensive Cancer Network, both recommend that all male breast cancer patients undergo genetic testing. So the last line of the ASCO Management of Male Breast Cancer Guidelines, this was published in 2020, the last line says genetic counseling and germline genetic testing of cancer predisposition genes should be offered to all men with male breast cancer. Um, uh, similarly, the National Cancer Care Network, this is uh, lar you know, very long and complicated 
list of bullet points for who should undergo genetic testing. Again, for men, that's pretty easy. It's just all males with breast cancer. In addition, if you yourself are not a male breast cancer patient, but maybe a family member of somebody who was, that is also an indication for genetic testing. So having a dad or a brother um, or a son with breast cancer is also an indication for genetic testing. So how is genetic testing and genomic testing done and how are they different? So I wanna talk about a few different types of tests that are out there just to make sure we're all uh, thinking about the same thing when we're talking about genetic testing. So what I'm talking about today when I talk about BRC1 and 2 is germline testing. Germline genetic testing looks at inherited genetic changes in the DNA that increase your risk for developing cancer. That word inherited is important. Those are genetic changes that you inherited um, from either your mom or your dad. This is in contrast to, for example, tumor testing. Now, this is a talk that I gave uh, for prostate cancer, so that's why I have a prostate delineated here. This is your bladder. This is indicated to be your prostate with a cancer here. You can also do what often people refer to as genetic testing on just the tumor. But remember that that testing is just looking for acquired changes, sometimes called somatic changes in the DNA that don't lead to an increased risk of cancer, but instead are involved with how the cancer developed in the first place or how it may be progressing. It is important to note that when your tumor is tested, you are in fact also testing your germline because your tumor contains all of the germline alterations that you inherited as well. However, depending on the way the test is done, those germline changes may not be uh, noticed or reported. So germline testing is done by a variety of country uh, companies in 2023. They're listed here, and there are many, 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 many others. Tumor testing is also done by a number of, of companies, again, listed here. There also are a number of academic labs that do tumor-based uh, testing. And so, uh, for example, if you were treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they have their own specific test that they do on tumors. I put the Oncotype DX uh, logo here because it's important for me to remind you that there are a number of other genomic biomarkers that exist in breast cancer and a lot of other cancers. So Oncotype DX though is not genetic testing. It's not even tumor genomic testing. It's looking at the expression of some genes, basically taking that sequence, that coding sequence, and looking to see what the re result of that coding sequence, namely the expression of a gene, is in your tumor. And so just to remember that this is not genetic testing. I've had many people come in and say that they've had genetic testing and they send us what they believe to be their report and we find that it's actually their oncotype score and not actually their germline genetic testing profile. So, okay, so that's what genetic testing is, but what genes should you get tested for? This is a big question that we get asked. Um, so how do we, taking just a step back, how do we choose what genes we should test anybody for with regards to any kind of cancer, in this case, male breast cancer. So the first thing that we ask ourselves is what are the risk of cancer if I have a mutation in that gene, this gene that we're considering testing? And we're not only thinking about breast cancer, but we're thinking about other cancers that that gene may have a risk for as well. And we really only, at this point, would like to test for things that we know have a higher moderate risk for cancer, because those are things that we would wanna do something about um, in, in your clinical management. We also test if we think that finding a mutation in the gene will affect your family. And so um, we know that we wanna test in that situation. We'd also like to test if we know that having a mutation in a gene would make the cancer more aggressive. Now this is variable. Some genetic changes cause certain cancers to become uh, more aggressive. And even that same genetic change could not let necessarily lead to more aggressive cancer in the, in another case. For example, for BRC2 or the BRCA2 gene, we know that it is associated with more aggressive prostate cancer, but we don't really know that there's much, there really isn't much data suggesting that BRCA2 men have more aggressive breast cancer, for example. So then the last consideration when we think about what genes we wanna test is that if you were to get cancer or have cancer, uh, can we target that genetic change for treatment? So there are a few genes for which all these um, answers are yes, and those are the genes that we really wanna make sure we test for. So I'm gonna go through this table, um, hopefully uh, slow enough to digest it. What this is looking at is uh, different genes 
what is the absolute risk of breast cancer? Now, these estimates come from studies that look at what is the absolute risk of a man developing breast cancer by the time he's 70. Um, this is the relative risk, which is a comparison to the general population. So different people like absolute versus relative risk. It sits differently with them in their brains. Remember that um, for relative risk in male breast cancer, we're starting at a very low baseline. So only about one in 1,000 men get breast cancer. So when we show these relative risk numbers, that's in comparison to one in 1,000 in the population. I'm also going to show you the strength of evidence for association with that gene, whether or not that gene has clinical implications, and what are the other cancer risks that a man who carries one of these mutations might be uh, at risk for. So we'll start with BRCA2 or BRCA2. So the absolute risk of a man to develop breast cancer if they have a BRCA2 mutation is approximately 2 to 7%. So 2 to 7% is still low. And I want to assure, remind everybody that that means that a man has, you know, an over 90% chance if they carry BRCA2 of never developing breast cancer. But that risk, a comparison to the 1 in 1,000 risk, is 20 to 70 times higher than the general population. So it's a very, very significantly higher increased risk. It's just important to remember that the absolute risk is still probably under 10%. The strength of the evidence for BRCA2s with male back breast cancer risk is very strong. We have many, many publications um, supporting this, uh, this association. And this gene has uh, very significant clinical implications for the man with breast cancer, um, and then also for his both male and female family members. Mainly men with BRCA2 mutations are at risk for prostate and pancreatic cancer as well, and their female relatives are at risk for breast and ovarian cancer in addition to pancreatic cancer. So the next gene is, BR is BRCA1 or BRCA1. The risk of male breast cancer in BRCA1 carriers is lower, and it is probably around 1%, which is about 2 to 15 times higher than the general population. We also have very uh, strong evidence for association of BRCA1 with male breast cancer. And just like BRCA2, there are other cancer risks as noted. So the next set of genes are genes that are a little bit newer um, in the male breast cancer space. I'd say that we have pretty decent data now for PALB2, similar risks to BRCA1 with regards to male breast cancer. CHECK2 and ATM are rarely uh, but found in male breast cancer patients. Um, all of these three genes, PALB2, CHECK2, and ATM, do also carry other cancer risks, which is why if we find a mutation in one of these genes in a male breast cancer patient, you know, it is important because there are other cancers that you might be at risk for. There have been some reports of P10 or Cowden syndrome patients having uh, male breast cancer. Just want to point out that that's in really, really small studies. Most of the time, if you were to see P10, you would see it on a tumor testing report. Again, that's not the same as the germline uh, risk. So these are the genes that we, um, we have pretty decent evidence for an association with male breast cancer right now. Um, but I'm sure as Dr. Uh, Orr or maybe others spoke about earlier in the day, there's a lot of work because this these genes account for only a very, very small proportion of the hereditary male breast cancer risk. And we have a lot of work to do to figure out the rest of the genetic architecture of male breast cancer. Okay, so if you've been diagnosed with breast cancer as a man, what genetic tests should you use um, for your germline testing? So I think it's important just in case anyone here was diagnosed prior to 2013, or I uh, had a family member diagnosed um, prior to that time. Until 2013, Myriad Genetics held the patent on the human BRCA1 and 2 genes, and they were the only game in um, available to do any sort of genetic testing. So if you had breast cancer prior to 2013, it is likely you had one of the Myriad tests, and that's it. Um, in 2013, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, companies could not patent human genes, and that opened up the market for a number of different companies to uh, do genetic testing, as listed here. 
However, as the number of companies has expanded, the number of genes associated with male breast cancer has expanded, there's many, many options when a genetic provider is ordering testing for you. There can be custom panels, there can be a variety of different genes on the panel that you get for genetic testing. And we're not done. There's going to be new genes that are going to be identified. There's going to be new types of variants in the old genes. Um, you know, here at the American Society for Human Genetics meeting where I'm at, we're learning about all the new types of techniques, you know, all the time that are going to be used to expand, trying to figure out uh, a genetic risk for the types of cancer. And so the take home is, is that you cannot assume what genes either you or your family member or friend have been evaluated for unless you actually look at the report and see what they were tested for. In addition, it means that you will not sort of look at this as a one and done phenomenon. If you had breast cancer 10 years ago, you would potentially like to talk to your oncologist about should I think about what's called updated testing. You know, even if you were tested last week, five years from now, you're going to want to talk to your provider about what's new and what sort of updated testing you might want to consider. So I just want to make a quick note about direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Um, it's the holiday season, so 23andMe has their, uh, as they typically do, you know, advertisements to uh, get your gift of 23andMe for your relative to make you healthier. Um, they've got a variety of different tests. They're cheap. The health and ancestry is $129. Um, and they do also advertise as being the first and only FDA authorized direct to consumer BRCA test. This is all well and good. And 23andMe is very open about the fact, though, that they are only testing a very tiny proportion of BRCA1 and 2 variants. So, up until recently, 23andMe tested for three variants associated with breast cancer in the Ashkenazi Jewish population only. They now do 44 variants, um, but this pie chart, you know, which is on their website, is an important reminder that that is a fraction of the variants that are um, that can be found in BRC1 and 2. And so it is my opinion that 23andMe is absolutely not sufficient genetic testing almost for any man you know, with breast cancer. Okay, so despite knowing about uh, BRCA1 and 2 um, for a number of years, uh, it's been almost 30 year anniversary from the cloning of BRCA1, we know that not enough men are getting genetic testing. So I don't have too many research slides on here. This is a research uh, project that was done um, with my, uh, at the time, fellow Jeffrey Shivak, who is now an assistant professor at Duke. Um, and this was a study where he looked at men who uh, were either cared for with commercial-based insurance via Optum or were cared for in the Veterans Health Administration. Um, he looked for individuals with a diagnosis of prostate, pancreas, or breast cancer, men uh, with one of these cancer diagnoses between 2019 and 2021. So just a two-year period um, with a new diagnosis during that period because with a new diagnosis in that time period, all of these men should have been referred for genetic testing. So uh, the study population um, uh, included 5,142 men with the different uh, cancers listed here in the commercially insured group. Um, that was about 314 male breast cancer patients in the commercially um, insured group. And then in the VA, that was 2,752 men uh, with cancer diagnosed in this time period, including 85 men with male breast cancer. And so what did he find? So this is a busy slide with a lot of bars. Um, in both of these graphs, the light blue indicates men of self-identified white genetic, uh, or sorry, white race or ethnicity. And the dark blue indicates men of self-identified black race or ethnicity. And then you have metastatic prostate cancer as the first bars, pancreatic cancer as the second set of bars, breast cancer in men again, this is just men in the last set of bars. On the left is the commercial insured individuals, and on the right is the veterans health. Um, we were, as a, a physician who does genetic testing in the VA, I was very happy to see that our highest rates of genetic testing were in black men in the VA, although that's a very small number of people, but that was 63% of our uh, male uh, breast cancer patients um, uh, in the VA who self-identified as black, that genetic testing, 47% of our white male, uh, male veterans. Um, but unfortunately, in the commercially assured, insured population, 
we saw quite a significant racial disparity with 53% of white men who were commercially insured getting testing, but only 36% of black men uh, with a commercial insurance getting tested. Um, I will say though, the breast cancer group did have the highest rates of genetic testing. It got uh, lower and lower as we went down from uh, to pancreas and to metastatic prostate cancer, such that overall only about 15% of men who have an indication for genetic testing in these two cohorts had actually received it. Um, I think these bars are higher for male breast cancer just because that indication has been around for a lot longer. Um, but because that indication has been around for so long, these bars should be 80 to 90 percent. You know, we know that some people are always going to decline genetic testing, but um, even with declining rates of up to 20 percent, you know, these bars are not as high as they should be. Okay, so a summary of this portion, um, all men with breast cancer should undergo genetic testing. If you have had genetic testing before, you should talk to your doctor about whether or not your testing should be updated. The minimum genes that I would say you should be tested for in 2023 as a male breast cancer patient are BRC1, BRC2, PALB2, ATM, and CHECK2, and maybe some other genes depending on your family and other cancer history. And not enough male breast cancer patients are getting genetic testing. So through uh, organizations like the Male Breast Cancer Global Alliance, um, I do you know, really appreciate the fact that there has been a lot of awareness that has been raised um, in this space, but we still have more work to do. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears now to talking about the Vassar Center's Men and BRCA program. Um, this is called the Men and BRCA program, but we do you know, really look at ourselves as hopefully being a resource for any man with any form of inherited uh, inherited form of breast cancer um, or any man who is newly diagnosed who has questions about whether or not they should get genetic testing. So this again is a busy slide. This goes over uh, men and BRCA's, uh, what's the cancer spectrum? So if you have been found to have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, you know, what other cancers might you be at risk for? Um, and this uh, basically just shows the spectrum of cancers that were reported in what's called the SIMBA consortium. SIMBA is a consortium where uh, healthcare centers around the world um, uh, send in their data so that it can be collected together and analyzed to look at individuals and what might their cancers, you know, be when they have a BRC1 or 2 mutation. I think probably this is um, a more, uh, again, uh, busy but more useful slide. So really what it points out are the cancers that we have good data that BRC1 and BRC2 men are at risk for. I had mentioned this on the prior slide. For BRC1, that's breast and pancreas. Um, uh, and for BRC2, that's breast, pancreas, and prostate. Notice stomach has popped up here. This is something that we are actively looking into. Uh, we don't, uh, aren't really ready yet to say that men um, or women with BRCA mutations are at risk for stomach cancer. We think that this might be um, sort of what we call recall bias where people came into the study and they said, oh yeah, my family member had stomach cancer, but that was really ovarian cancer, for example. Um, so we're still not 100% sure about that. Um, overall, though, I just want to show these graphs um, because I think that these are what's important if you're a male breast cancer patient thinking about, okay, I've had breast cancer, now what? Now am I going to get, you know, prostate cancer, for example? So for BRCA2 men, um, this looks at the risk absolute risk of getting prostate cancer um, as you get older. Of course, there's just red here, of course, because there's just males. This was one study. They reported that as, you know, basically before age 50, very low risk of prostate cancer. And then at 60, that started to go up, such that by the time um, these men were uh, over 80, there was approximately 20 to 40% risk of prostate cancer if you have a BRC2 mutation. So that um, is, is notably about two to four times higher than the general population risk. Um, there have been other studies, though, that have suggested prostate cancer risk is even higher. Um, for BRC2 in this study, the uh, estimate by 85 was around 60%. Um, and then in this final study here, for BRC1 was somewhere between 13 and 50%. And here for BRC2, somewhere between 34 and 88%. So I show this to show a couple different points. One, if you have a genetic change, um, there's lots of data, but 
that data is not as robust as we would like it to be. And often there is still disagreement between studies as to the actual risk of other cancers. In addition, what's important for me to talk about here is that not all genes are the same. So even for BRC2 and BRC1, you know, they have basically the same name, just a different number. The risks of another cancer for a man, say, who is a breast cancer survivor, thinking about his other cancer risks, even for BRC1 and 2, those risks are different. So every gene is different. And it's important to talk with um, your doctor if you're a carrier about what the specific risks are for you with your specific genetic change. Okay. So I wanna talk now about if you're a man with a BRC1 or 2 mutation, why do we care about knowing about that? What can we do that would change your management? And I look at this in sort of four spheres, um, screening for either, uh, for other cancers, particularly in this case, if we're talking about a man who's had breast cancer already, what is his, what type of screening should he do for other cancers? Uh, prevention of other cancers, treatment of a cancer that you may have, and then family planning. And these are all, you know, not necessarily applicable to a given man at all times of his life. They may no longer be applicable to him or maybe there, but they might be applicable to his son, for example, or his daughter. So for male BRC1 and 2 carriers for screening, um, if you have not had breast cancer, and especially if you've already had one breast cancer and retain breast tissue, either in that breast or the other breast. It is very important that you institute breast screening with mammograms. Um, we you know, are still thinking about whether every BRC1 or BRC2 carrier, so say you haven't had breast cancer yet, should all men with BRC1 and 2 get mammograms? I think we're moving that way. Um, there used to be this thought that, well, only if you had gynecomastia should you get a mammogram. But really, the American College of Radiology does not agree with that statement. You do not need gynecomastia to consider doing a mammogram. Now, for very thin men, this could be technically challenging. And also, the physical exam is very uh, good in a man who's very thin. Um, however, thin men can have a lot of breast tissue, um, and overweight men can have a little amount of breast tissue. So really, it's not as much about your weight and more just about your own biology um, with regards to the breast tissue that you have. Um, uh, there is also a movement, as I know, to think about uh, going away from breast screening and away from mammograms, calling this chest screening chest cancer screening. I do think that these are important for you and your doctor to figure out what's going to need the most important thing for you. What will make you the most comfortable when you talk about this kind of screening? Um, uh, unfortunately, we probably won't get away from the term mammogram. Um, however, I do think that it's important to be open with your provider who's taking care of you as to what, how you would like that terminology to be used. So beyond breast screening, um, men with BRC1 and 2 mutations uh, should consider uh, pancreatic cancer screening, uh, typically at the age of 50. Uh, these uh, abbreviations here refer to an endoscopic ultrasound or a magnetic resonance uh, angiopancreatic. Oh my God, I'm going to forget that word, MRCP, uh, which is an MRI-based screening. Um, prostate cancer screening begins at age 40 for men with BRC1 and 2 mutations. Um, and that's with a blood test called the PSA test um, and uh, with or without what's called a digital rectal exam, uh, which is a physical exam of the prostate. Um, oops, sorry, went the wrong way. Um, prevention is next. This is unfortunately an area that we really do not have enough research in. We have very little evidence for any sort of prevention in men who are BRC1 and 2 carriers, really for any of the cancers that I talked about. I spend a lot of time talking to people about diet um, and exercise. You know, there's really, unfortunately, not too many things that we know for sure are going to work. However, a heart healthy diet is definitely a cancer preventative diet. Um, so I think that that at this point, you know, is really uh, what we have for prevention. But I do think that, you know, this is an open space that we need to really um, consider. And a lot of research is going into even things like cancer vaccines for individuals who have BRC1 or 2 mutations. From the standpoint of treatment, certainly for women who are BRC1 or 2 carriers, um, the choice of a bilateral mastectomy comes on the table. But that choice is there for men as well. Not all men with breast cancer 
need to have a bilateral mastectomy, if they carry a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, that's likely going to uh, affect their decision making uh, for, for, uh, for a mastectomy. And then unfortunately, if breast cancer spreads outside of the breast, um, uh, both platinum chemotherapy and PARP inhibitors specifically work for uh, BRCA1 and 2 carriers. Also think it's important to bring up family planning. Um, many, many more individuals, especially those from families highly affected by their genetic change are considering prenatal genetic diagnosis, which basically means they go in, they do in vitro fertilization with their partner and those embryos are screened for the familial mutation and only the embryos that don't have the mutation are implanted. Some people look at me and say, there's no way, that's playing God, I would never do that. Other people look at me and say, that's the best thing I've ever heard. So it's a very uh, personal decision, but do know that that is an option. Um, when I meet men who have BRC1 and 2 mutations, the vast majority of the time, the thing that they are not concerned about is themselves, is the thing they are concerned about is their daughters um, or their sisters. Um, so what are the implications if you find out as a man that you carry B or C one or two for these important uh, women in your life? So women with B or C one and two mutations undergo pretty intensive screening for, for breast cancer. Uh, there is also ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer screening. Um, but there's a lot more when we talk about prevention for women. There are medications, tamoxifen to treat breast cancer can be used for prevention in women. Uh, with BRCA1 and 2 mutations, um, oral contraceptives decrease ovarian cancer risk. And because the risks of, of these cancers are so high um, in women, you know, 80% uh, for breast cancer and up to 40 or 50% for ovarian cancer, which is a very deadly cancer, uh, women often consider prophylactic surgeries to remove their breasts and definitely to remove their ovaries to prevent cancer. Treatment um, is the same um, implications and as is family planning. So I just wanna wrap up my time with you today um, and hopefully this will leave some time for questions um, uh, and any sort of discussion that anybody would like to have with talking to you about the Basel Center for BRCA and our work in um, uh, men's uh, cancer and genetic risk. So the Basel Center for BRCA was established in 2012. I can't believe it's actually we're 11 years old at this point. Um, established by an incredibly generous um, donation from John and Mindy Gray. Um, Mindy lost her sister Faith to BRC-related ovarian cancer. Um, and to change that, they have established this wonderful research organization. Our website is listed here. Our leadership team, our executive director is Dr. Su Susan Domchek. Ronnie Drafkin and Roger Greenberg uh, lead some of the uh, more basic and translational work. Catherine Nathanson, Kate Nathanson is the director of genetics, and then Beth is our administrative director. And so we've been doing a lot of work for a lot of years in DRCA, um, but unfortunately, you know, we all recognize that we weren't doing enough uh, in the male uh, cancer risk space um, with regards to BRCA carriers. And so um, due to a, a really generous um, and anonymous gift uh, from another donor, um, we were able to establish the Men in BRCA program last year. Um, we have a, a tripartite mission for research, education, and patient care. I am the director of that program. And my leadership team includes Bryson Katona, who is a gastroenterologist interested in pancreatic cancer screening. Dan Lee, who is a urologist interested in prostate cancer screening. Vivek Narayan does prostate cancer treatment, and we are all coordinated and kept together um, by our wonderful <laughs> program manager, Caitlin Allen. Um, so you'll notice on here, we don't have a male breast cancer person. I've done a lot of genetics in my, um, in my past, um, but we're really looking to partner with male uh, breast cancer researchers um, to try to improve um, care, uh, particularly in familial breast cancer. Um, these are some of our research programs that we have going on right now. As I mentioned, you know, these are uh, really um, around the prostate cancer um, uh, and sort of improvements in germline genetic testing space right now, really looking to expand our reach in uh, male breast cancer. Um, and these are two QR codes for more information. This is our um, BRCA men website. Um, this is our uh, fact sheet that we have for male BRCA1 and 2 carriers. 
I'm very new to the QR code generation. I hope this works and doesn't bring you to some other random site, um, but you can also screenshot the websites and everything is linked off of the basso.org website. Um, so I thank you for your attention today.